Let's answer the age-old question. What would Avatar The Last Airbender characters look like as Magic the Gathering cards? I'm taking this one season at a time and splitting the characters in two for each season to show their developments between the beginning and end of each season. An individual card can't show the depth of each character, so I've combined all their abilities from the general beginnings and ends of each season. I will not go over all of the characters in the show in this video just the main ones. I'll do the other characters in other videos in the future kind of split up to where it kind of makes more sense and it just makes it easier to digest. And as an added note, these should all theoretically be legendary creatures due to the nature of Magic's story, but I've only chosen to make them legendary when each creature reaches their full potential in the show, the one only exception being Aang. Starting off with the first half of season one, Aang the Last Airbender. He's a white, legendary human monk. He's a 0-2, costs 2 and a white. He's got Defender. He can't be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. And he has whenever another creature you control dies, Aang the Last Airbender gets plus 3, plus 2 until end of turn and can attack as though it didn't have Defender. This ability triggers only once each turn though. Aang is of course a monk and has zero power and defender because of his unwillingness to fight or even attack during this early stage in the show. He's always passive, but particularly so at the beginning. He only gains a huge buff in power when another of your creatures dies. This symbolizes his changing into the avatar state when he sees monk Gyatso dead in his childhood home. Now he's not very powerful in the avatar state at this point, and that kind of shows it's a really big buff in, say, Magic's game, but I don't know, maybe you'd think it's stronger. I think this is an appropriate level for this stage in the show. His plus three, plus two buff puts him at a similar level as Zuko from the first half of the season, which I thought was appropriate because Zuko is essentially his evil other half in season one, but we'll get to Zuko a little bit later. Next, we have Katara, eager friend. She's a 1-1 one, one human. She's blue and costs one and a blue. When Katara, eager friend, enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls, and that creature doesn't untap during his controller's next untap step. Katara isn't particularly strong during the events of the first half of the show. She basically has no water bending skills and is pretty weak in a fight, let's be honest, but she does have enough strength to freeze an opponent or two to incapacitate them, even just for a little bit, as we see on the fight on Zuko's ship as one of those preliminary fights. She's kind of disoriented, doesn't really know how to, how to do much, but she does manage to freeze one person. Yeah, so it's not particularly strong here. Sokka Headstrong is a blue 1-2 human warrior it costs one and a blue, very similar to Katara. Uh, but when Sokka Headstrong enters the battlefield, you look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the other on the bottom of your library. Sokka, like Katara, isn't very skilled or strong, even though he thinks he is. He's a warrior due to his devotion to his tribe and family and willing to fight no matter how unskilled he is. His pseudo scry ability is due to his ability to be a leader, always trying to think ahead and think twice before he acts. Again, this is not very strong because he hasn't really developed into himself at this point in the show, but it will get better over time. Sokka has one of the longest character arcs, I feel like, and just kind of takes him a while to get to where he needs to be, and probably like season three is when he really starts to shine. Finally, for the first half of season one, we have Zuko, Fire Nation Outcast. He's a red 3-3 human berserker. He costs two and a red. First strike, trample, haste. Zuko Fire Nation Outcast attacks each combat if able. Zuko is not okay during the first part of this series. He's of course stronger than the other three I've shown so far due to his, you know, daily training. He's the son of the Fire Lord, so he's probably been training forever. Plus he's a firebender and he's angry at life and everybody else kind of doesn't have as much experience as he does. He's very reckless, hence haste and first strike and attacks each combat if able, signifying his recklessness. And he can kind of get around defenses a little bit with those that firebending ability, hence the trample. And as I said earlier, I think Aang would have been able to beat Zuko if he was in the Avatar state. Say he met Zuko while he was in Avatar state when he saw Monk Gyatso. Those two, I think, I think Aang could have beat him right there. And making Aang a 3-4 when one of your creatures dies shows that he could beat him in combat in a specific set of circumstances. Which, you know, I think this is all pretty, pretty flavorful in my opinion. 
I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Okay, now the second half of this season is where the show really starts to gain momentum, and I'm happy to see the results of these cards. I spent a lot of time on them, and I'm really proud of them, and I hope you guys like them as well. First off, again, we have Aang, student of many. He's a 2-2 white and blue legendary human monk. He costs three white and blue, and he transforms, but I will get to that transformation in just a second. Aang, student of many, can't be blocked, and whenever a creature with power 4 or greater deals combat damage to you, you transform Aang, student of many. Aang has grown a bit throughout the season, mostly mentally. He's confronted his fears, been taught valuable lessons from various masters, and really started to grasp his role as the Avatar. He's a bit stronger because of his ability to waterbend now, and his unblockable ability helps him avoid enemies a little bit better than it did before, because he still doesn't really want to hurt individuals, he kind of just wants to sneak around the problem and hit it dead on. Now, let's get to his flip side, so when you're dealt damage by a creature with power 4 greater, he transforms. Aang transforms into La, Avatar Incarnate. It's a blue elemental avatar. When this creature transforms into La Avatar Incarnate, return each non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. Now, Aang Student of Many transforms when a creature with power for greater deals combat damage to us. Now, I'm very proud of this Aang card. I spent a lot of time on it thinking about it. He's added blue to his color palette, you know, signifying his waterbending skills now. And he... You know, he's got that transform ability where he really becomes one with a spirit and with water bending, with air bending, and just being in the avatar state and being able to wipe away his enemies. And I thought the cyclonic rift type ability was very, you know, very significant. And it's actually, it's a really fun card. You know, if, it's, if you get to play it, it's, I, it's just super cool. It's like cyclonic rift on a stick when it transforms, so it dis discourages people from attacking you. Anyway, it's a super cool card, and I, something like it should exist, I think. Now we have Katara, Willful Bender. She's now legendary. She's a human warrior, and she costs two blue blue. Whenever Katara, Willful Bender attacks, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature doesn't untap during his controller's untap step for as long as you control Katara, Willful Bender. When you tap a creature on your turn, she gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Now, Katara is much stronger and can get stronger as you incapacitate enemy creatures. With her freeze ability, she uses a ton. And she's now a legendary creature because she's at the height of her power from now until the bloodbending episode. And yes, she still trains and such throughout the show, but this is where she really sees her future potential, making her legendary. This is almost the peak of where she is until, like I say, that the third season where she really, really learns water bending to a kind of sickening level. Her once weak freezing ability can now take care of multiple creatures at once, making her harder to deal with while attacking. This is kind of the, the whole octopus thing that she can do and it kind of incapacitates people all at once. Those creatures stay frozen for as long as she's out and while giving Katara Willful Bender a nice combat bonus. And I think the additional plus one plus O until end of turn for each creature you tap on your turn kind of signifies her willingness to just, you know, attack right there, right in a situation. And she gets stronger with everybody she incapacitates because she can get right in and deal a lot more damage. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. Sokka, a thoughtful thinker. <laughs> He's a one, two human warrior, costs one blue, blue. When Sokka Thoughtful Thinker enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library, put two of them into your hand and the others on the bottom of your library in a random order. Okay, let's be honest, Sokka doesn't really grow much in this season, as far as combat strength that is. The Thoughtful Thinker ability to look at the top five cards of your library now shows he's a bit more wise in dealing with others and especially women, you know, on the whole island of Kyoshi thing. And again, not much else gained for Sokka, but don't worry, he gets better as he as the show goes on, and he'll definitely be much better in Season 3. Zuko, Desperate Exile. 3-3, three, three, red and blue, human survivor. He costs two red-blue. Zuko now has First Strike, Island Walk, and when Zuko, Desperate Exile, enters the battlefield, you gain control of target creature and opponent controls for as long as you control Zuko, Desperate Exile. This card is a snapshot of Zuko in the final episodes of Season 1. He's been betrayed by his own people again. He's still reckless, so First Strike hasn't really gone away, but he's gained blue to his color palette. 
Throughout the second half of the season, we see Zuko as the blue spirit, and we see him escape perilous situations because of his resourcefulness. And that's kind of what blue does. It's very resourceful, kind of thinking ahead. And Island Walk shows his ability to infiltrate enemy lines in order to achieve his goal. His ability to steal a creature for as long as you control him snapshots his capturing of Aang, and he still beats Katara in a fight, you know, in the game and in the show, and is able to snag Aang and get away, at least for a little while. Now, bum 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 bum, the last card is my favorite of the season. Drum roll, please. Admiral Zhao. 4-4, legendary human soldier, blue, black, red. He costs three, blue, black, red. Oh my gosh, I love this. For one and a red, Admiral Zhao gets plus one, plus zero oh until end of turn. For two and a black, destroy target creature or enchantment. You lose life equal to that permanence mana value. And three and a blue, gain control of target creature and opponent controls. This card is so symbolic in color, every ability, and in strength. Remember how Aang only transforms when a creature with power 4 or greater hits us? Well, it's Zhao that can do that. Zhao is dark, frivolous, and cunning, making him a perfect choice for the Grixis colors. His first ability is a fire-breathing ability, showing his rash nature. You know, as Aang kind of teases him, he burns all the boats, but he just gets more and more and more, and that's the cool fire-breathing ability. The second two abilities go hand-in-hand, -hand with abducting the Moon Spirit and then killing it. Sure, it hurts, but it's all in the name of the Fire Nation, you know, being able to destroy a creature enchantment. And I feel like the fish are enchantment creatures, you know, they're spirits, but they're kind of mystical. It's kind of like enchantments almost. And so kind of that ability to destroy a creature enchantment is so cool. But then when he does, you know, Iroh fights him and it kind of hurts a bit, you know. So anyway, <laughs> it's super cool. And I, I got a lot of uh, help with this card just looking at like Sakama and just kind of like picking pieces and parts and making Zhao a really cool, I think, commander. I played around with this a lot and I'm very happy how it turned out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found enjoyment in this video because I sure enjoyed making it. I did a ton of research and thought long and hard about each character before I finalized any version of each card. Let me know what you think in the comments and tell me what character you'd like to see in the next video. And make sure to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss your weekly dose of magic! To support this channel, visit the TCG Player affiliate link in the description below. And if you want to support the channel directly, visit patreon.com slash Manfred plus magic. As a patron, you'll have access to the community discord where you can talk with myself and other friends about all things magic. And you'll find even more benefits for each tier, starting at $1 as a copper. Cool. D U N. <laughs>